there is only one person that's keeping you from realizing all of your dreams, doing everything you've always wanted to do, the things that you always tell everyone about, but you never end up doing. And I'll show you who this person is, or at least who this person is for me. So for me, it's this guy. He's the one that's keeping me from realizing all my dreams. For you, just pick out your phone, put it in the selfie camera mode and take a picture. And that's the person. And the key thing is that the way we see ourselves and the way that we believe in the things that we are able to do or that we're supposed to be doing is very important. There's a book that's talked about by some of the most successful people ever, people like Tony Robbins, people like Vince Lombardi, who's an American football legend, Oprah Winfrey, who's also an American television legend, and other people that were super successful. And they always talk about this same book. And it's a book that's from 1960, so it's quite old. And it was written, even though it's about psychology, about achieving things, about success, it was written by a plastic surgeon. So you would not think about this as a self-help, self-development book. But Psycho-Cybernetics is one of the most talked about books of all time. And there's a reason for it. So you can see that I'm almost done with it. So this is why I'm going to talk about it now. And I actually intend on doing a series talking about each chapter. So I'll make a video for each chapter because this book is very valuable. It has a ton of insight. Today, I'm going to talk about four of the core principles in the book. But really, each chapter of this book is life-changing if you let it. And a cool thing about this book is that at the end of each chapter, it'll give you a page to note down the five key points. So the five bullet points that you want to remember about the chapter. And then it will have another page so that you can write like how this happened in my life or um, personal experiences that can be explained by the principles of this chapter. So it's a very interesting way of doing a book, of making the reader do a little exercise after the chapter so that you can really rethink what are the main points for you and how they relate to your life or to things that already happened in your life, which is a good fo food for thought in anything that you do. Not only when you're learning something, it's very good to do this active recollection of the main points in something that you've just read, but also when you're thinking about your own clients or people in your life that you want to teach something or to serve them in certain forms, think about how you can help them by making them do some of these little exercises. But back to the book, let's talk about some of its key concepts. And the main concept of the book is the concept of self-image. And it's really interesting to think about this book because since it was written by a plastic surgeon, Dr. Maxwell Maltz, who didn't start his life working with helping people develop themselves. He first became a plastic surgeon. And one of the stories that he tells in the beginning of the book is how he went to study plastic surgery in Germany because Germany was the place to study plastic surgery at the time. But people didn't believe him and didn't believe in him. And he didn't really have the money and he had to believe in himself first and take a bunch of risks and go to Germany and try his luck. And this was one of the things that led him to start thinking about this concept of the self image about how we see ourselves and how the way we see ourselves, the image we have of ourselves 
relates to the way that we act in the world and to all of the beliefs that we have. But also, as he started working with plastic surgery, he realized that, one, many times people that didn't really have anything special about how they looked, want, but they really wanted to do plastic surgery. Maybe they had a little tilt on their nose or their ears, instead of going this way, they were a little bit like this, but they really weren't anything special. Like people that didn't know the person wouldn't even think, wow, he, he has some, he's a monster. No, it was about how the person saw themselves and how they thought that it was this little, little, little thing about them was something that made them monstrous while other people, their friends, their family, people they interacted with, many of them might have not even noticed. And you know, it's funny because I've seen this with people in my life as well. I've seen friends that did plastic surgery for things that really, I personally hadn't even noticed. And I'm, I'm, I'll bet that most people around him had not noticed or wouldn't think it was a, a great thing, like a great quirk of them. It wasn't super special in a bad way, but they went and did the plastic surgery or people who have problems with food, things like anorexia, bulimia, they have this self-image that they are one way they look themselves in the mirror and they see themselves totally differently from what other people see them. So this is how the concept of self-image may act in a more physical sense. But at the same time, Dr. Maltz noted that many times what really changed the person wasn't really the plastic surgery itself, but how they started seeing themselves differently. And in many cases, later on, as he progressed with his teachings and as he started focusing more on the psychological aspects than on the physical aspects of like, maybe some guy had a scar on his face. To certain groups, having a scar on your face was actually seen as a good thing because it meant that you were valorous. For example, long time ago, like a hundred years ago or more, there would be these duels with swords. It was very prevalent in Germany. And it was seen as both as a valorous thing because you were courageous to get into a duel and also as a status symbol because duels were things that the high class would do which is really, really odd if you think about it, but it is what it is. So having a scar on your face was seen by these people as a sign of value, as a sign that you were brave, as a sign that you were rich, which is pretty crazy. And at the same time to most people in most societies, if you have a, a big scar on your face, you will probably think it's a bad thing. So it's, it's funny to see how the groups we are in and the society we are in might shape how we see those things. But back to the concept of self image, Dr. Maltz saw that many times by focusing on some exercises to change that self image, the way that you see yourself, Many people didn't actually need the plastic surgery after they were able to do these exercises to reshape their self image, to see themselves another way. The people didn't really need the plastic surgery anymore. And it's crazy to think that this is not only physical at all. It's much more a uh, psychological or even spiritual thing. If you think about how your limiting beliefs shape how you see the world, or not even just the limiting beliefs, your beliefs in general, 
the things that you constantly pay attention to, as they say, where uh, attention goes, energy flows. So by constantly paying attention to certain things in the world around you, in your life, this is where your energy will flow. And this is what will make things bigger in your mind than they're supposed to be. And you can make things bigger that will help you in a way, or you could make things bigger that will be things that will work against you. So if you're thinking like the mind of an anxious person, and I used to be quite anxious and thank God that I've done a bunch of things that helped me become less anxious. But the mind of the anxious person, you're always thinking of what if. So what if I talk to that person and they say this, and then you think about what you, you will say next. And But what if instead of saying this, they say that. So you also have, you have this whole decision tree of what ifs. What will I do if they say this and this and this and this? But then when you go and actually talk to the person, they say something that catches you off guard something that you totally weren't expecting. And then you're like, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? I didn't think about this specific thing that they might say. And you realize that you can't predict all of the what ifs. And by letting go of this and by trying to focus on the present, focus on the moment, this is how you actually get rid of it. And this is how you stop getting, you stop anxiety, you start getting rid of anxiety. By being able to focus on the present and not think or overthink about what's coming next. So if I was thinking about what's coming next, I'd, I wouldn't be able. So you see, I kind of stuttered right now because I was thinking too much about what's coming next because I was talking about thinking about what's coming next. And if you do this in your own life, you'll notice if you are in the middle of a conversation and the other person is talking to you and you start thinking, well, what, if, what am I going to say next? Or if they say this, I need to say that. You get into your head and then you aren't able to be present in that conversation and have the best outcomes for this conversation. And everything has to do with the self-image. So if, if you don't believe that you can be a good public speaker, you won't be a good public speaker. You need to be able to visualize, to see it in your mind first. And it's all about truly exercising it, literally exercising and visualize, visualizing the power of visualization is the second thing that I wanted to talk about in this video that Dr. Maltz talks a lot about in his book and being able to visualize, see yourself doing the things. So if you can't see yourself running a marathon, you won't run a marathon. If you can't see yourself giving a good public speech, if just by thinking about getting on a stage, having a hundred people, 200, 1000 people looking straight at you and paying attention to what you're saying. If just by thinking about it, you start getting anxious. What do you think will happen if someone asks you to give a presentation to 500 people one week from now? Of course you will get anxious. Of course you will have stage fright because if not even in your mind, you can see it as something that you will be successful in, of course, you won't be successful when the time comes. But think of it another way. What if you can close your eyes and see the exact picture? And first of all, if you're feeling a bit anxious just by thinking of it, frame it in a way that you don't, that feeling of anxiety is not anxiety anymore. It's actually, it, it's a signal from your body that it's something that really matters, that it's something that you really should pursue. So if you change your mindset about that feeling, because actually anxiety is an interpretation 
of certain cues or certain emotions that we have. But you really, if you frame it a different way, if you start thinking this is anxiety, because it, it becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy and it becomes a vicious cycle. So you get anxious and then you think about, oh my God, I'm anxious now. What do I do? And then you get more anxious because you're anxious. And then it's a self-perpetuating cycle. And then that's how some people end up having panic attacks because it's that self-perpetuating cycle. And by doing something else, like getting one of those paper bags and breathing in, breathing out and focusing on your breathing, you take away your attention from the thing itself. And then you're able to focus on something else. And then you're able to break that cycle. But back to vis visualization, it can be really helpful, not only for things like public speaking, but for instance, I do this all the time when I'm thinking of going to the gym and you know, sometimes you don't really want to do something. You're tired or you're not really feeling it. But an easy way is to see yourself doing the little steps that will take you there. So in the case of going to the gym, see yourself just putting on the gym clothes and then see yourself walking out the door, see yourself getting into the gym, see yourself and try to actually feel it like close your eyes and see yourself like doing the exercises and feeling all of the things that you will feel when you are at the gym. And just by visualizing you are feeding the same neural pathways in your brain and your mind doesn't know the difference that that's the key thing about visualization. Your mind doesn't know the difference between what's imaginary and what's real life. It's, it's quite crazy if you think about it, but you know, when you have a dream and when you wake up, you're not sure if it was real reality or not, that's the power of the subconscious mind. It's so powerful that you can truly reprogram yourself, how you see the world just by visualizing things in a different way and using visualization techniques in a consistent basis. So I talked about how you can rehearse going to the gym, for example, or back to the public speaking thing. You can rehearse public speaking, but you need to always see it going the perfect way. Don't think about what if, what if, what if, what if I stutter? What if, um, you know, I trip when I'm getting onto the stage? Don't think about those things. Think about the successful version. Think about the perfect getting on stage, the perfect saying hello to the audience. Think about how it will be going perfectly because you need to set your goal and focus on the goal. Don't focus on what could go wrong. You're visualizing, you need to see yourself doing the thing and doing it perfectly. And if you are going to think about going wrong, I think this is something that you should only do in a more advanced stage. If you're still in the stage that your natural way of doing things is thinking about what could go wrong. Don't think about it now. Try to think about the perfect one. Of course, no, yeah, just forget about it. Just forget about it. Don't think about what could go wrong because your natural state will be to be thinking about everything that could go wrong and all of the what ifs, but you shouldn't do this because, you know, it's like a pendulum. It's a pendulum that's swinging. And in your case, you're right here on the max of overthinking on the max of thinking about the all of the things that can go wrong. So you have to push to get into the equilibrium point. You have to push real hard on the pendulum so that you can get to this point. So for you, it will be, it will seem like, oh, I'm being unreasonably optimistic about things. I'm being like, 
I just can't think about bad things. Like to you, it will feel weird because you're not used to it, but you will have to push real hard on the pendulum so that you can get closer to the equilibrium point. And it happens with other things in life. If you are used to being a pushover and a people pleaser, for example, when you start setting boundaries, when you start saying no to people, it will feel weird. It will feel like, uh, I'm not used to saying no. I, I shouldn't say no. Um, or what will they think? What will they feel? I don't want them to feel bad because I'm saying no, but in all actuality, you're only thinking this way because you feel very bad when people say no to you. So you think that they will feel that bad. And in all actuality as well, who cares if they feel that bad? If it's something that will make you feel bad, you're not doing anyone any favors by doing it and feeling bad about it because then you will resent the person you will resent doing the thing and eventually you will lash out on them or even worse you might lash out on someone else and if you don't lash out on someone else you're sure as hell that you will lash out onto yourself so you will resent it and resenting is about resenting so zenting is about feeling it comes from the lat the latin word sentire that in Portuguese, sentir, sentir is also like feeling. It's the verb for feeling. And resenting is re-feeling the same feeling over and over again. So you might have, you're not in the situation anymore. It's past, but you every time you remember it, since your brain doesn't know the difference between what's reality and what's not, for your mind, it's like you're really reliving the same event over and over and over again. So every time you think about something in the past and you go back to it and you get pissed off again because someone said something or someone did something that you didn't like, you're refilling it and also you're making that neural pathway in your mind stronger. So going back and resenting things is one of the worst things that you could ever do because you're just making it stronger. And this goes to the third important concept about the book, Psycho-Cybernetics, that I like to talk about today. And that's the concept of the emotional surgery. So when you hurt yourself physically, you get a scar. And your body makes scar tissue. I'm, I'm looking for some scar in my body that I could show you guys. I don't think you will. You're probably, yeah, I think you'll be able to see. So I have a scar, actually two, over here. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see it. So when I was little, I was about nine years old, I think. There was this party at my school and I was playing soccer with a few other boys and a couple of dads. And there was this ball that I went to, to jump, to like head it, you know, when you... You, you kind of dive into the ball to try to head the ball. That's the thing in soccer. And one of the, the boy's dads, he, he was, well, we were just playing. Like it was like little kids and it wasn't anything competitive or anything. But he went to try to get the ball with his foot. At the same time that I jumped, he wasn't expecting that I was going to do that. So what ended happening is that like, he pretty much kicked kicked me on the face, not with his foot, but like I, I think I I got his leg. And this action, like my tooth kind of burst open over here. So you can imagine like 
the horror for this dad because like he kicked the little boy in the face and it burst open like his lower lip and I had like blood gushing it, it was like a carry the stranger kind of scene it was to people seeing it it must have been bizarre like and I, I'm pretty sure that my t-shirt that day was white so I had this blood gushing on the white t-shirt which was pretty crazy but anyways I ended up with this car and nowadays people don't even see it anymore because well first of all it's very old so it did eventually oh you can see it here I think um maybe not see it but I can definitely feel it so the thing that happens when we hurt ourselves is that our body doesn't want us to hurt the same place anymore so it thinks well if something happened and I hurt this part of my body let's put things around it let's surround it with more tissue so that this won't happen again so if the same thing happens we won't hurt it because we're stronger over there so that's the thing with scar tissue it's your body making a barrier around the place that you hurt so that you won't hurt it anymore and it's funny because i, I if i move my tongue over here i can feel this the tissue it's like two little clumps that that are here in the place where I hurt. And if you if you have some some type of scar, you know what I'm talking about. And if you don't have, like, did you even have a childhood? But anyways, we also do this with emotional scars. So when someone hurts you emotionally and you feel very bad about something that someone did to you or something that someone said, you also create an emotional scar. So this is the concept of the emotional surgery. The same way that you can remove a scar via plastic surgery, you can also do this emotional surgery and go back to those times and relive that moment in a way that you can get rid of it. So you don't resent the moment anymore. You don't relive that moment in a way that makes you feel those bad feelings anymore. You actually relive it in a way that you can let go. You can actually let go of things when you truly, how do you say it? When somebody says, I'm sorry, and then you, Oh my God, I can't believe that I forgot this word and I'll have to research it. Forgive. Oh my God, how did I forget about forgive? But anyways, truly forgiving is about really forgiving the person. You don't think about it anymore. It's not, you, you can't say that, oh, you know, I forgave you, but I didn't forget. If you don't forget it, you didn't truly forgive. And you know what's the funny thing about forgiveness? It's not about the other person, actually. It's about you. It's about yourself. So when you forgive someone else, the person that truly benefits from you forgiving is yourself. Because then you start, you stop thinking about that. You stop resenting the person. And this is all about the concept of the emotional surgery it's about removing that scar so if your wife cheated on you or if your mom said something that you didn't like when you were a kid or if your dad abandoned your family or if your business partner cheated on you some way like he stole money from you or someone did something that you really didn't like if you say that you forgive them, but you don't forget, you're still thinking about it. Every business transaction that you go into, you're thinking, well, will they steal me too? Well, do, what do they want from me? 
you can see how these things pile up and you'll never be able to truly live your life if you still have that scar, that emotional scar that keeps you putting out barriers to certain things in your life. So if you had a problem with your parents, maybe if it's your dad, for example, maybe you have problems with authority figures for the rest of your life until you get rid of the problem with your dad. So that's also why so many therapists and the, some of the biggest of them, like Jung and Freud especially, they talked about how the relationship with our mom and dad when we are little, how they influence all of our relationships down the line because we take them as a model when we are little kids. We really have to take things at face value because we have no power. We are totally powerless as little kids. We are weak. We are small. We can't fend for ourselves in nature. So we need to take things for face value. And when we are hurt consciously or unconsciously by our parents, we tend to take those things because they are very deeply subconsciously in you. But if you're not able to get over certain things, once you're an adult, once you're able, of course, when you're a little kid, there's pretty much nothing you can do. But later on, the way you see those things and the way you choose to relive them or not, that changes your life completely. So this is the concept of emotional surgery, of being able to go back to those emotional scars that you have. And many people, they think about those scars like if it's something that they can be proud of. Like they really think, oh, they attach to that suffering. They don't want to hold, like they hold on to it and they don't want to let it go. And I mean, if you want to keep suffering, if you want to keep feeling that suffering, like by all means, do that, do you. But for me, and I hope that for you as well, you don't really want to keep suffering and especially suffering about the same thing over and over, like just move on and do something else with your life. And if you are that kind of person, you're in the right place because I talk about this kind of thing all the time. Independently of the subject that I talk about, there's always an underlying layer of self-development, of how we can improve our beliefs, of how we can see ourselves through a, a better lens, and how by seeing ourselves through a better lens, we we'll also see other people through a better lens, which also has to do a lot about with the things in this book. And it's really funny that Sometimes when I'm reading this book, many of the things that he talks about, they don't feel like they're a big breakthrough because I've read similar things in many different places. But now I realize that since this book is from 1960, so it's over 60 years, most of those other books that I read before actually were referencing this book, not the other way around. So... Reading this book is kind of a coming full circle moment for me. And I'll leave a link if you want to check this book out, because I think it's a very interesting book, really. And like I said, I will do one video for every chapter of this book, because truly every single chapter of the book has something that you can learn from and something that you can apply in your life. But now, let's talk about the most important concept of the book. Or well, maybe not the most important. Maybe self-image is in the same tier, probably. But the two S-tier concepts of the book are these ones. Self-image and the automatic success mechanism. You see... Why is this book called Psycho-Cybernetics? 
if you're anything like me, you probably thought about cybernetics as something that has to do with computers. And it's kind of right. But you see, cybernetics comes from a Greek legend. And it's about basically um, a captain of a ship. So uh, about how he would, you know, change the the way the ship was going, like the direction the ship was going through, oh, how do you call the, like the, the steering wheel on, on a boat? I forgot how we called it. Is it the rudder? So the legend was about this guy on a ship that was like change the rudder so that he can move the ship wherever he wants to go. And then later on in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, people started trying to make automatic calculating machines that eventually became what we call computers today because when we were able to make the microchips, we were made, able to make those calculations super quick. But a long time ago, computers were those huge contraptions that required massive rooms full of mechanical things moving. It, it, it's crazy to think about it. If you never saw this, go check out how a computer looked. And did you know that actually the PCs that we use, the PC meaning personal computer, because of course, when they were massive building size things, they couldn't be personal. They were used only for research purposes at universities or big companies or government buildings. But those PCs, personal computers, they were also called microcomputers because they were the small versions of those gigantic computers. But anyways, back to the automatic success mechanism, it's about feedback loops. It's about your subconscious mind. It will try to make reality anything that you truly believe or anything that you really set out to do, any goal that you put into your mind. So if you put the goal in your mind of, well, I'll use one example from my own life right now. So I really want to get to a bench press that I can get 100 kilograms or 220 pounds. And I put it in my mind that I would do it by the end of the year. And last week, I was able to do 90 kilograms. That's around 200 pounds. And of course, I had a spotter and I did only six reps, but I was able, it was my record so far. So getting to 100 by the end of the year doesn't seem far-fetched at all. But this is a thing. I put it in my mind that I wanted to get to 100. And then each week, I'll do my best. I'll try, of course, there's ups and downs. There are days you didn't eat that well, you didn't sleep that well, but it's about having the tendency going up. And lo and behold, slowly but surely, I'm getting there. The same thing you can apply to any goal in your life. So if you want to become a doctor, for example, if you're 15 and you're thinking of going to med school, you need to think about, you have that grand objective, becoming a doctor. And like you set out on that path and then you think, what are the things that I need to do to become a doctor? So I need to get into med school. How do I get into med school? I need to study for the exams. I need to do whatever it takes. I need to start incorporating some of those beliefs, some of those core principles of the self image of the type of person that will become a doctor a few years from now. So little by little, you take step by step, always with that goal in mind, and you will get there. The same thing with the boat analogy. So if you're going from point A to point B, of course, the sea will drift you 
one way or the other, but you're always doing those little corrections. And I made this so that we can show it over here. It's the automatic success mechanism. Here we have the success rocket. And, you know, in the book, actually, Dr. Maltz talks a lot about missiles and torpedoes because it's from 1960. So it was just after World War II. It was in the midst of the Cold War about the Soviet Union and the U.S. fighting for space supremacy in the space race. But, you know, actually the space race wasn't really about exploring space. It was more about making those missiles that and showing off to the other side their capacity. And this is what eventually led to MAD or mutually assured destruction, which in a way was good because it led to a peace between the, the two great powers of the time. But anyways, if we want to take the rocket of success from point A to point B, and assuming that point B is something grander, something bigger that you want to achieve, you know, there are infinite, an infinite amount of ways that you can do this. You can do it like this. You can do it like this. You could, you could theoretically do it on a straight line. But really, what tends to happen is that things never go on a straight line in nature and they never go on a straight line in our lives. So what would probably happen actually would be something more similar to this. So when you're here, you set out to get to this point. So you, you put on your GPS, I want to get to a certain city. But then, boys, you end up deviating a little bit over here. Maybe I should use a, a nautical analogy or an airplane analogy because it, it kind of makes more sense, right? You end up deviating and then something else happens and you end up deviating a little bit more. What do you need to do now? You need to correct the rudder. So you deviate to the other side and then you keep correcting. You need to keep correcting your way so that you will get to this, the right place. You can use a similar analogy maybe to parking a car into uh, a, a some spot that's hard to park in. So every little degree that you turn the steering wheel, you're trying to correct the path. So every step that you take towards your goal, you won't just take steps on a straight line. That's impossible. But this is the thing about the automatic success mechanism. If you have your big goals in mind, if you're constantly thinking about them, if you're constantly visualizing them, if you're constantly seeing yourself doing those things, then you can trust your automatic success mechanism to correct your course. So naturally, you will correct your course. So for instance, back to the gym analogy, if you see yourself as an athlete, if you see yourself as someone that goes to the gym five times a week, if you think of yourself that way, it's much easier to actually go to the gym all of those times and to do those things than if you simply decided to use the power of will. So it all has to do as well with the self-image concept. If you are able to change the way you see yourself, it will become much easier to do the things that have to do with that person that you want to become. So it's always a feedback loop between how you see yourself, 
your goals and using that automatic success mechanism in your favor. And here's the thing. If you don't do this cautiously, you will do this subconsciously by the programming that you already have in your mind. But the programming you already have naturally comes from the things that you learned when you were a kid or from the things that you learned in school or from the things that you learned from the media. But the thing is, who says those are the things that are authentic to you? Those are the things that you should be truly striving for. Not necessarily you should be striving for the things that are on mainstream media. Actually, let's face it, you probably should do the exact opposite of what you see on mainstream media because you know who watches a lot of mainstream media? NPCs, average people. Do you want to be average? And really it's about thinking, how does the average person look nowadays? Are they happy? Are they fulfilled? Are they healthy? Are their relationships good? Not really. So why do you want to live an average life? You don't. You want to live a life that's fulfilling. You want to live a life full of love. You want to live a life in which you're healthy, in which you have energy to do the things that make you feel fulfilled, that make you feel truly happy. Because happiness is not about hedonism. Happiness is about choosing a struggle that is aligned to you and that you like to and living in flow and doing those things and getting better at something and then being able to share your craft, to share your talents with other people and to also being able to appreciate other people's talents, being able to live in community in a positive way. But if you are constantly letting other people and not necessarily the best of people control your subconscious goals, your subconscious, you will end up letting your automatic success mechanism think that those goals that those people put out are your goals. And then your subconscious will be taking you towards the NPC path over and over again. You will be always going towards that path. But if you want something else from your life, if you want to achieve true success, if you want to achieve true fulfillment, true happiness, this guy is your best friend. You will think about that point B. So point A, where you are. or who you are, and point B, where you want to go. Or who you want to become. First step to do this, changing your self-image. Really thinking about what are your goals? What are the things that you really want to do in your life? Then changing your self-image so that you can start becoming the kind of person that truly achieves those things. And taking the steps every single day towards the place you want to go. Of course, there will be days you'll come to the right, to the wrong side, but then you'll need to do the corrections that eventually will take you to the right place that you want to go. And the place that is aligned to you by your true values, by your authentic self. And this is what about being yourself is about, actually. We think it's about being the person we're used to being but actually it's about going deep 
and finding who your authentic self is, the person that was put in this world to do something. You are here, you have a specific mission in this world. So you need to find out what the mission is and go do it. Otherwise, you will always be unfulfilled. You will always be unhappy. You will always be looking for that pleasure in something else and somewhere else. You won't be truly happy. You will be looking for a happiness in a place that it doesn't exist. You might be looking for it in parties and money in drugs in screens, but you will never be truly fulfilled if you don't do that exercise of going deep into yourself, of finding out and of starting to take those steps towards the person that you really should be and the person that fulfills your destiny. And if you do that, you will see that you can be happy wherever you are, even in point A, because you know that you have this goal and you know that you're taking the steps. So you learn to appreciate the process of getting here. You appreciate even those small mistakes, even when you deviate from your path a little bit, you know that you have a greater mission and you know that you have a greater objective. So you learn how to appreciate this as well. And you learn to be happy right now because the thing is, if you are able to feel like you are already successful, like you are already happy right now, you won't be able to do this when you achieve what you think you're supposed to achieve. Because otherwise, you will always be on to the next. You will always be looking for the new goalposts. You will get to a place and then you move the goalposts and now you need to get to another place and another place and it's always on to the next. And I, I don't say this meaning that you shouldn't always strive for something more or to see because actually you kind of are trying to figure out what are the limits always. This is the thing why it's so dopaminergic and why people like doing things and being successful, you're always trying to figure out what's the limit. Oh, this is not the limit. So now I have a new limit. Let's try to get to that one. It's not about this, but it's about being able to feel good wherever you are in the journey, being able to already feel successful because you are trying and you are successful. If you are trying, if you are not afraid of committing a mistake, you're not afraid of trying new things, that's success already. So just because you still can't get 500 pounds on the bench press doesn't mean you're not on that journey and that every step of the way you can't be fulfilled because every one of those little goals Every time that you are a little bit better than you were the last time, that in and of itself is already the fulfillment you need. And of course, you will get there eventually. Hopefully, if you are consistent, if you keep trying, you will get, get there. If you do the course corrections and, and keep trying, you will get there. And... Before we finish, let's go back a little bit here. You know, because sometimes people think, well, I, I should never give up or, or I should never, you know, I think people have a misconception about giving up. Sometimes you will notice that you took a bad path. So, so by changing, your mind a little bit about the strategy or the tactics you're correcting the path it's not that you're giving up it's just that you you have a great goal a grander goal you're not giving up you're just course correcting and this is something that people kind of misinterpret sometimes but you need to course correct 
And I don't really understand the concept of giving up, actually. I think giving up would actually be foregoing that notion that you can get better and that notion that you may do greater things with your life. I think it's giving up is something that really you need to be in a very dark place to give up. But at the same time, you can think that you gave up, but that be just a phase as well. And then eventually you get out of it like Batman did when he got out of the Lazarus pit. Yeah, it's hard to imagine. Like for me, giving up really is something really dark that only happens when you're not willing to recover from it. But if you're here, you are willing to recover from anything. You are willing to become more resilient and you're willing to improve your self-image so that you can achieve everything that you set your mind to, that you put on your automatic success mechanism. You're willing to do the emotional surgeries to take off all of those little scars from your mind so that you stop presenting things. You're willing to visualize yourself doing all of the things that you want to do, all of your greatest dreams, because you're awesome, because you have an inner rock star inside of you. I know you do. And if you like this video, please comment, like, subscribe, send it to your friends. You know, my objective is to help you guys unleash your inner rock star, that person that you always wanted to become, the Tyler Durden, to that nameless NPC main character from Fight Club. And keep in, like, and I'll be doing a video for each chapter of this book because I think it's a very important book that can help you a lot in your life. And we'll go more into each of those concepts about, we'll talk about some exercises that you can do in your life to visualize, to help you improve your life. And I'll leave the next video over here so that you can continue visualizing, you can continue improving your life, and you can continue unleashing your inner rock star. Keep rocking, keep rolling.